I'll sort myself out. I'm Jacob, if you do not know me, and I'm preaching through 2 Peter. So we're starting 2 Peter. So I've got a question. What do you want your last words to be? What would you want your last words to be? I think that we would want our last words to be wise, wouldn't we? Wise, impactful, and encouraging. These are the last words of Tim Keller. Some of you might have known him, uh, known of him. He was a pastor in America. Uh, And on his deathbed recently, speaking to his wife, these were his last words. He said to his wife, there is no downside for me leaving, not in the slightest. Here he encouraged his family, his wife, in the face of his death, that death is not the end for him because he trusts in Jesus, that he is going to a better place. And he's there now. He's with God. What incredible last words, packed with meaning and encouragement. The book of 2 Peter is actually effectively the Apostle Peter's last words to the churches in Asia Minor. He's written one letter to them. He's now writing a second. Imagine that you're part of that church that Peter is writing to. It's about 65 AD and persecution under the Roman Emperor Nero is increasing both in its uh, severity and its scope. You became a Christian a few years ago, maybe, and you're really eager to live out your faith in Jesus. But now you feel like you need some encouragement. You need a boost. Then you hear that the Apostle Peter has sent another letter to your church. You're excited, right? Your church family, they congregate together at this news to read the letter out loud. What are Peter's final words to you and your church in need of encouragement? What's Peter's final message to build you up and establish you in the faith? Will he give you some new insight that will maybe change the way you understand the very nature of God? Will he share some wisdom that's going to help you live a godly life? Will he share with you a key that's going to unlock a deeper relationship with God? We can often feel discouraged as Christians, feeling like we're doing the same old things in our faith. We're reading the same old book, the Bible, going to church and hearing the same old stuff that we've heard before. We go off to work, we do the same tasks we do every week, without much regard really to the God we praise on Sunday. We're tired, we long for just that little bit more from God, something new, just a little extra nugget of insight. Maybe the Apostle Peter, in his last words, will share that little extra nugget of insight to help us know God better, to be more excited to live the Christian life. So what is Peter's final message? Let me read verses 12 to 15. Look down at them with me. He says, So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. Because I know that I will soon put it aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. Did you notice what Peter is saying? Look at verse 12. Peter uses the word remind. Then in verse 13, he uses the phrase, refresh your memory. And then in verse 15, he wants to make sure they will remember these things. It's interesting, isn't it? Peter's final message is actually not a new one. He's not bringing some new message, a new nugget of insight. He's actually reminding them of something they already have. He is reminding them, even though they already know these truths and are already established in them. If you're like me, when you know something, you you don't feel like you need to hear any more about it. If you already know your times tables... You won't go through the experience of learning them again. You already know them. There's no need. Although we wouldn't always admit it, this is often how we can feel about the truths of the Bible. I already know what the Bible says about sin. I know that Jesus came and dealt with it on the cross. Surely I don't need to be told these things that I already know. Again, I need something new, something exciting, right? Well, Peter doesn't think this way. With his final words to the churches in Asia Minor, he doesn't try to give them something new or flashy. 
something extra insightful. He wants to remind them of what they already have, what they already know. And he sees this as being of utmost importance and relevance to them. The church in 65 AD and the church here in Lancaster in 2023, we don't need something new. We need to be reminded of what we already have, the knowledge we already have of who God is and what he has done in his son, Jesus. In fact, Peter starts this letter not by elevating himself as an apostle. He doesn't suggest that he's got something extra that they need to get to the next level of Christian living. Rather, he says this. He says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. When you trust in Jesus you receive a faith as precious as the Apostle Peter. It's crazy, right? You, you, if you trust in Jesus, receive a faith as precious as Jesus' right-hand man, Peter. You don't need something new, something flashy to spice up your Christian experience. You need to be reminded of what you have in Jesus. And Peter's going to go on to unpack what the church already has in the first 11 verses of chapter 1. And we're going to look at it under two title, titles. So firstly, you have all you need. We're going to look at verses 3 to 4 for that. So you have all you need. And secondly, we're going to look at uh, verses 5 to 11. Therefore, make every effort. So firstly, you have all you need. Verses 3 to 4. Now imagine this scene. You've been asked to put up a shelf. But instead of being given a nice drill... Uh, some screws and anything else necessary to put up a shelf, you're given a single nail and a rusty screwdriver. Given what you have, the task seems impossible, right? You're ill-equipped and therefore unable to put up the shelf. See, this is how we can often feel in the Christian life. We rejoice in the salvation Jesus has won for us on the cross, but we find it hard to live in the light of this great salvation. We know that as Christians, we're, we're actually called to live differently, to reject the wicked ways of, that we once walked and to put to death the old ways of the flesh and to live godly lives. However, we feel unprepared and ill-equipped to do this. We can feel like we lack what we need to live the way God has called us to. It seems like an unachievable task. Maybe you have a tendency to gossip and speak about people behind their back. You know it's not right, but you don't feel able to stop. You feel ill-equipped. Maybe each day you fight the urge to watch pornography, but every once in a while you give in to temptation. You feel ill-equipped. Maybe you have a short temper. You pray for God to help you, but you still find yourself blowing up whenever anything happens. You feel ill-equipped. Maybe you are very happy living a comfortable and quiet Christian life and you avoid thinking about telling your friends and family about Jesus because you don't feel confident enough to do so. You feel ill-equipped. You see, we feel ill-equipped to live the way God has called us to live. What is Peter's message, his final message for the church? Will it help them? Will it help us? And we feel ill-equipped. Will it help us live the way God has called us to live? Well, look at verse 3. Peter starts in verse 3 by saying, His, that's God's, so his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. You have everything you need for a godly life. You aren't just making do with the little you have. God has given you everything. Everything needed for a godly life, for life and godliness. Now, I wonder how this verse makes you feel. I think one of two ways, probably, how you'll feel. You might actually feel a bit guilty. If I had everything I needed, well, I should have been able to live a godly life, right? You might feel disappointed with yourself, as if you were given all the tools you needed to put up the shelf, but you still haven't managed it. That is one way you might feel, but I don't think this is the way Peter intends you to feel when he wrote this verse. 
He didn't write this so that you would feel guilty and disappointed with yourself. He actually wrote it as a reminder and as an encouragement. You have been given everything you need for a godly life. That means you you aren't ill-equipped. You don't lack anything. As a Christian, someone who trusts in Jesus, you are not lacking a specific experience or some extra knowledge that will take you to the next level of being a Christian. Being godly actually isn't something unattainable and it's not something you're being told to do even though you don't have the right tools and you can't. Rather, you have everything you need. He's not placed a rusty nail and a screwdriver in your hand and asked you to put up a shelf. He's given you everything you need. Now, obviously, this isn't to say that you'll be perfect now, that you'll get everything right now, but it's to say that God has given you everything you need to grow in him. You've got everything to grow in godliness, to grow in controlling your temper, to grow in biting your tongue when you want to gossip, to fight the internal temptation to watch porn. You're not fighting these battles with a cardboard sword and shield. You've been properly equipped. You've been given everything. I think that's encouraging, but I don't think we've got to the core. I don't think we've gotten to the core, have we? We know, okay... We know he's given us everything we need, but what specifically is it that he's given us? I think he's given us knowledge of himself and his promises to us. Let me read again verses two to four. Pay attention specifically to the words through and the word knowledge. Verse two, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Notice that knowledge of God actually is knowledge of God the Father, who called us to his own glory and goodness, verse 3, as well as knowledge of Jesus, verse 2. And it is through this knowledge that we are equipped and given all we need. It's through knowing God and his great promises that we are given all we need for godliness. Peter's encouragement is that we have everything we need. We have the right tools to put up the shelf. We've been given knowledge of God. We've been given knowledge of his son, Jesus. We've been given knowledge of his promises to us who trust in his son for salvation. But what does it mean to have knowledge of God? What, like, to, to have been given knowledge of God? Well, I think, I think it's weird. We, we use words in all sorts of different ways. Uh, When I say I have knowledge of something, I could mean many different things. I might say I have knowledge of maybe a historic event, World War II, let's say. When I say that, I'm saying that I know that it happened. Maybe I know some different facts about it. Okay, I, I, I have knowledge of World War II. When I say I have knowledge of Justina, mine and Beth's pet rat... Uh, I'm actually saying a little bit more, aren't I? I, I'm not just saying I know of Justina's existence. I know, obviously, I know she exists. But I know a little bit more, don't I? I'm saying, well, I I know what she's like. I know maybe how she'll respond to different situations based on how she's responded in the past. Now, when I say I have knowledge of Beth, my wife, I'm saying even more than that. Again, I know when she was born, I know some facts about her can tell you what she's like and maybe how she'll respond if I do certain things. But my knowledge of her is even deeper. As my wife, she's actually allowed me to get to know her. And far more deeply, and throughout our marriage, she's revealed more and more of who she is and what she's like to me. You see, the knowledge of God is far more like that. It's personal. It is deep. It's more than just knowledge about God knowledge about World War II, it is deep and personal knowledge of God. And you see, just like our knowledge of other people is actually very much based on how much they're willing to let you know, how much they're willing to reveal, 
it's exactly the same with God, actually. And incredibly, God has not kept himself distant. He's not hidden himself. Rather, God has revealed himself to us and continues to invite us to know him more deeply. And through this knowledge, he has given us all we need to live godly Christian lives. As we grow in our knowledge of God and his precious promises to us, we're equipped to live godly lives that please and glorify him. You have everything you need. You have knowledge of the living God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the land and the sea, the visible and the invisible. You have knowledge of Jesus, his son, who died in our place, who took the penalty for our sins upon himself, who rose again to glorious life that we might be certain that we have life in him forever. Before moving on to my next and final point, let me read verses three and four again so we can sit in this. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Okay, second final point. There's really a response to this. It's a response to hearing that God has given us all we need. How are we to respond? Verses 5 to 11, we are to make every effort. We're to make every effort to live godly lives because God has actually given us all we need for godly lives, for living the Christian life. Or verses five to seven, they say it like this. Peter says, for this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And to goodness, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. And to self-control, perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, mutual affection. And to mutual affection, love. We've been given all we need But this doesn't actually mean we are to sit there doing nothing. You see, we're called to make every effort. The Christian life is not one of laziness. It's actually one of action. Even if you have everything you need, if you don't do anything, nothing's going to get done. I could have the fanciest drill in the world, the best screws, the best shelf, all the equipment I need, but if I don't get off the sofa the shelf will never get put up. Having been given everything you need for godliness through the knowledge of God, you're called to grow in godliness, to reject sin and to live the way God has called you to live. Now, before continuing, I want to address something. I think it's really important. The Christian faith is all about grace. This means that we do not and we cannot earn salvation for ourselves instead it's given to us god gives it to us the only reason we can be forgiven brought into relationship with god and know him deeply and personally is because god by his own loving kindness chose to do all of this for us through jesus the christian faith is all about grace given freely by a loving god however often in our attempts to hold to this truth And to defend it from attack, we actually can undermine the importance of godliness, of rejecting sin, of living the way he's called us to live. We make it seem like godliness, well, it's not as important because God is so forgiving and gracious. It's worth remembering who wrote this letter. Peter, he is a believer in God's grace. Those of us who have read through Mark's gospel in our midweek Bible studies this year will have seen Peter time and time again fail Jesus. Peter, he denied Jesus three times, only a few hours after claiming, he claimed, if everyone else leaves you, Jesus, well, I won't. A few hours before he did deny Jesus three times. You see, Peter did not earn salvation from God. Actually, it was given 
to him by God, graciously given to him through Jesus on the cross. Peter is a big believer in God's grace. And yet, here in verses 5 to 11, Peter takes godliness very seriously. You see, he upholds the truth of God's grace without undermining the importance of godly living, of turning from sin and living how God has called us to live. See, he's not a personal trainer that doesn't really care if any progress is made. Yeah. By writing this letter, he's standing next to the church, encouraging them to keep running the race of godliness, fueled by the knowledge of God that has been given to them. Have you ever felt content with your knowledge of God, with your relationship with him? Have you ever thought, well, it's great that I trust in Jesus, now I, now I can just coast the rest of the way? Or maybe... I'm going through a really busy stretch in my life. I'm just going to park my faith to one side for the next few months until the busy stretch has passed. Peter highlights the problem with this kind of relaxed attitude towards godliness in verses 8 to 9. Speaking of the godly qualities of verses 5 to 7, he says this, verses 8 to 9. He says, For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is short-sighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. For Peter, growing in godliness is important, particularly for two reasons, one positive, one negative. So the positive one is that if you are growing in godliness that this will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in the knowledge of Jesus, from being ineffective and unproductive in your faith. As Christians, we're called to glorify God, to enjoy him forever. Growing in godliness will help us do that effectively. That sounds like a really, really good reason to take godliness seriously, doesn't it? Peter also gives a negative reason. And this is it. Whoever is not godly or whoever is not growing in godliness is actually being foolish. Peter describes them as short-sighted and blind, unable to see just how bad it is that they are neglecting living godly lives. In doing this, they're actually forgetting that they've been cleansed from their past sins. Now, if you have ever had a young child or been a young child yourself, so I guess everyone, Uh, you might have experienced, or you could at least imagine a situation like this. Imagine a small child. They've been playing outside, and they've gotten themselves absolutely covered in mud. Yeah, they're filthy. Mud's in the hairs, it's in the ears, it's under the nails, it's everywhere. Okay, being responsible, you take this child to a bath. They need a bath. They're, They're cleaned, you put them in clean clothes. Well, the Christian who... Is, isn't growing in godliness, who doesn't care for godliness, doesn't see the importance of growing in godliness. It's like that recent, recently bathed child running straight outside again in their clean clothes and jumping headfirst into a pit of mud. It's foolish. Talking about godly qualities, verse 9 says, whoever does not have them is short-sighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Well, as Christians, we have been given all we need to live rightly before God, to turn from our tendencies to sin, to live godly lives. We've been, we've been given all we need through knowledge of God, through the knowledge of God. We can know God, not in the way I know about World War II or about my pet rat but in a deep and personal way. Therefore, we are to make every effort to live godly lives, to take godliness seriously, to grow in godliness and to glorify him in the process. You see, we've been given the screws, the shelves, the drill. There's no piece of equipment that we lack. So 
let's get off the sofa and put up those shelves equipped and energized by our deep and personal knowledge of God through his son and our saviour, Jesus Christ. Why don't I pray for us? Father God, we thank you so much for your grace to us in revealing yourself and calling us uh, to know you deeply and personally. And we thank you um, that you have given us all we need through this amazing knowledge of who you are. We pray that we would take godliness seriously, that we would turn from sin, and that we might find energy and strength to do so in the amazing truths of the gospel. Ultimately, that you sent your son Jesus to die for us, that we might have life forever with you. We pray all of this in your son's holy name. Amen.